first book in the Bible. Not the oldest book in the Bible. Some say that Job is older than Genesis, but it's the first in order of uh, being placed in the scriptures as we read them. Genesis is book number one. We're going to verse 11, or chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. And the message is entitled, City of Nimrod. And you know about the Tower of Babel. You've heard it. You've probably studied it. And as we do share together, I direct your attention to Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, Come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages, then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. There's a backstory to just about any story, wouldn't you agree? There's a reason why a story exists, and there's nothing different about this. In um, understanding the backstory of why the Tower of Babel is so important in our theology and thinking about who God is, we have to go back really to the very beginning. We have to go back to the Garden of Eden. The Tower of uh, Babel in Nimrod's city, Babylon, is one further step here of the evidence of humanity's downward tendency toward evil, not toward good. There's two schools of thought about human beings and original sin. You know what original sin is, right? That's what Eve said Adam did, and Adam said Eve did. Um, if you think about it, people have these two schools of thought. Number one is we are born in total innocence with a proclivity, a tendency to do bad, to get worse. The other school of thought is that we're born in evil. We're born with a sinful nature and we only get worse. So I don't think either school answers the question comprehensively or sufficiently. But uh, we'll dig in a little bit further as we get into this message. But as I said, we need to go back to the Garden of Eden in order to investigate this a little bit to understand why Nimrod's city is such a hinge point in our theology. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve swallowed more than just a piece of fruit. They swallowed Satan's offer of advancement by knowledge. In some way, this first couple imagined that life would be simpler for them, better for them, if only they knew as much as God knew. They sensed that God knew a lot more than they did, and therefore they wanted that as well. And after all, they'd be able to make their own decisions if they were as smart as God. And they were as wrong as a pair of glass slippers on Cinderella's sisters. God judged them for it, and paradise was lost. Adam and Eve's son, if we move on in the story, came, carried on the family business. He chose an offering to bring to God, and it was different than what God had demonstrated was the acceptable method of worshiping him. And so God rejected Cain's offering. In Cain's life, because of what he did in response to that, Cain's life became an unbearable wandering of a convicted brother killer, the judgment of God. Fast forward to Noah, a few generations later, 
uh, the pretenses were all off. All bets were dropped about worshiping God. People just lived thumbing their collective noses in the face of God. Wickedness, great wickedness, enveloped the entire earth, and wickedness said, I am my own God. They were also wrong. And they suffered the worst judgment of history, not just history up to that point, but to this point. Because God sent a flood that covered the entire wicked earth and took out all but eight people out of the entire population of earth. That tells you something about the wickedness of that time. Well, after the flood, God plainly stated what was and continues to be the problem of mankind. I want to read for you half of a verse, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. The end part of that verse says what God thinks about that question I posed. Are we born totally in innocence with a proclivity to get worse and do evil, or are we born in evil and are going to get worse anyway? God said this, everything they, meaning us, everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childhood. Every child born and aren't they sweet when we look at them, especially if they're ours, right? I mean, they're just gorgeous, and they lay there billing and cooing and filling diapers and all that other stuff that they do. And they are just so adorable. And it's hard to imagine a child being born with the Adamic nature, the sin nature, as we call it, as the Scripture calls it. But that's what God says here. It says everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from <clears throat> childhood. So we can't answer the question definitively. Scholars have still debated, will debate it until Jesus comes back, about whether we're born in total innocence or we're born evil. But whichever it is, and it has to be one or the other, from childhood, from the time we begin to understand the difference between right and wrong, we choose wrong. We choose to rebel against God. That is what sin nature does. Nimrod, I mean, with the, the, the memory of the, of the flood still very fresh in their memories, with the command of God to Noah as he came off the boat. Do you remember what God said to Noah after he came off of the ark and he built an altar and he worshiped God? you remember what God said to Noah? He said, spread out. Go and replenish the earth. Now, at that time, with only eight people in this whole ball of wax we call earth, it was necessary to replenish the earth in a biological sense. We needed more people than eight people to govern the earth, right? And so God said, replenish the earth. But there's another thought on that, especially germane to our day where we are right now about replenishing the earth, and I'll get to that at the close of the message. With the memory of the flood still fresh, with the command of God to spread out over the whole earth to replenish it, man did what man does, the opposite of what God said. Nimrod wickedly and openly defied God. He gathered the people together and refused to spread out. This is the basic flaw of a sin nature. We call it the pride of life. It's where we say, I'll do what I want, thank you. I don't care what anybody else wants, including Almighty God. Now, we build buildings, don't we? I mean, you and I are worshiping in a fine building today. Uh, this was built long before any of us were even thought about. You live in a building, you go to work in a building, you go grocery shopping in a building. What's wrong with building a building? And we would ask the question of the scriptures, what was wrong about building a tower? It's just a building, right? Well, there are four reasons that the tower was a wrong idea where Nimrod and company were concerned. First reason is that it was the wrong plan because it wasn't God's plan. God had told Noah, spread out. But Nimrod, one of Noah's descendants, rose to leadership in that early society. And scripture tells us he became a mighty warrior, a hunter. Now, it was Nimrod who conceived and attempted building the tower near Shinar. 
Nimrod's whole project centered on the idea of building a worldwide central control in one spot and around himself, and that was a wrong plan. It was a wrong plan. You and I might disagree at times with God's idea. You know, most of my family is over six feet, including some of the ants that have now gone on to glory. Uh, why he only made me 5'11", I don't know. I disagree with him. I want to be as tall as my brother, who's six foot three. And, you know, I want to be able to run the basketball like he could. But, uh, you know, I disagree with that part of God's plan. But, you know, it is what it is. It was God's choice to make me who I am and the height that I am. Now, that's a little frivolous, but you get the idea. Because we do wonder about our condition. We do wonder why so-and-so has this and we don't. We wonder why so-and-so didn't get that disease, but this person over here that I love got that disease. We wonder about those things. But God has this universe that he created, and he knows the best plan for it. In verse of our text, it says that they were afraid to spread throughout the earth. Fear can drive us to an awful lot of poor choices, can it? This is the opposite of faith. And so, wrong plan, Nimrod. Secondly, Nimrod was the wrong person. The plan of Nimrod was centered on the wrong person. It says that he said, let us make us a name. And when Nimrod was talking, he was using the royalty form of speech when he was saying, let us, he was saying me. I want to make a name for Nimrod. I want Nimrod's name to be inscribed on everything here. In, today, in today's culture, this is the celebrity mentality. To have everybody know your name, and it matters very little in that kind of uh, culture what you do to achieve that notoriety. Would you agree with me that some people do some pretty dumb things to have notoriety and, and get fame throughout the earth? Um, well, I could go on about that. One time during his, uh, during his prime, the, the great boxer, Muhammad Ali, uh, boarded a plane for a flight, and the stewardess came up to him and said, be sure to buckle your seatbelt. He looked at her and he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And he, she looked back at him unimpressed and she said, Superman don't need no airplane either. So he buckled his belt on that particular occasion. Nimrod was a man with a wrong plan, and he was the wrong man. But thirdly, Nimrod also built with a wrong purpose. Ancient ziggurats, that's the word for the tower. Don't you love that word? Don't it just roll off into a ziggurat? I'd love to say it. Say it with me. Ziggurat. Oh, come on. I didn't hear you even under the mat. Now, <clears throat> the ziggurat, the tower, was built with stair steps. Always on the outside of these ziggurats, these towers, there were places to walk on the outside, and it was like a spiral staircase where you could walk upward, 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 and get to the highest point. It's climbing a mountain, isn't it? Nimrod's tower was a high place. It was a place of gaining access to the heavenlies. This was the ancient practice of grabbing for power, and it's still a current practice, isn't it? Uh, Nim the purpose here was to replace God's control with Nimrod's control, and so it's a wrong purpose. God has declared in many ways that his throne and his dominion are his, and he doesn't share that glory with anybody. Now, if you need a verse to write down, this is it, Isaiah 42 and verse 8. The second half of that verse, God says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else, nor share my praise with carved idols. And so anything that gets worshipped other than God Almighty is worshipped in error. This was the wrong purpose. Essentially, this tower was Nimrod's declaration of independence from God. And that's not something God has ever taken lightly in Scripture, and he still doesn't. So we have these three reasons, a wrong man with a wrong plan and a wrong purpose. And the fourth reason is a presumption, which was wrong. A wrong plan, wrong person, wrong purpose, wrong presumption that we can possibly replace God or his influence on our lives. Yet humanity has tried to do that ever since Adam. 
I called this passage a linchpin, if you will, on all of our theology, because on it a lot of doors swing. Nimrod thought that he was God enough to control this whole earth. He said, let us make a name, and he got one. When I talk about the door and the linchpin and our theology, we have to take a look at what's on either side of the door. On one side of the door is God, and on the other side is Nimrod or his ideas, his plan, his purpose, his motivation. Um, Nimrod and his followers wanted fame, and they got it. They're famous for their failure. The name Babylon means gate of the gods, and that's the name of the city in which he built this tower. Incidentally, it's uh, pretty close to where Saddam Hussein lived, if you remember. The place, however, today is known as Babel, which literally means in English, confusion. Our word Babel is kind of like that. Person that babbles on and on and on like some preachers. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but confusion, right? So they got their fame, but it was for failure. The question that uh, that comes to me out of all of this, I mean, that's the story. What do we do with the story? The question then becomes: What towers do you and I build? What towers do we build in our lives that are similar to what Nimrod was trying to do? When Nimrod's bunch was afraid to spread out and colonize the world. I call this the love of the huddle. It's that comfort zone where we gather together with those that we like and who are like us. I have an idea that you like each other. I really do. You know, I, I look out and I see the face, I see the eyes, and I see you sit in the same place. Uh, maybe those who are sitting way on this side are not so fond of those who sit way on the other side. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. But the point is, I get the idea that you like each other, and you come here every week, just about every one. The point is, the comfort zone is provided in an atmosphere like that. We go to places where we like, and where we like the people, and where they're somewhat like us. Nobody's exactly the same as anybody else, we know this. But gathering together with people we like and people who are like us is typical for human beings. It is also typical for what Nimrod did. He wanted to gather everybody in close, don't spread out all across the world. But that is exactly what God has said. And we do the same kind of thing. I was like that when I went to seminary. I had the idea when I went to seminary, and even after I graduated, that I would wind up in some nice little church where everybody would just love me. <laughs> and it would be a sweet little huddle forever and ever. Boy, you talk about presumption. <laughs> Wrong presumption. I've been treated in the ministry to some wonderful times. I mean, and there are a lot of memories right here in the past almost nine years that I could put in that category, but there have been the other times. In ministry, 40 years worth, I've been spat at, I've been cussed at, I've been fussed at, I've even had a gun pointed at me. The point is, even though I've been tempted to quit. I've been prone to complain, and my wife will tell you I whine a bit, sometimes a lot. I want to stay in the huddle instead of getting the game. My deep down inner self, though, tells me and knows that God's best is not to be found in the comfort of the huddle. That's not to say that the huddle is bad. This huddle is good. This huddle is where we talk about God and we lift God up and we worship Him and we give to His cause and we, we make decisions to work in His cause. This is a good huddle. But if we stay in the huddle, and this is all that there is to our faith in God, so now we miss the point. Because God's best is out there. It is not in the huddle. It's where the work is done. The work isn't in here. We're not working for the Lord in here. We're huddling for the Lord in here. We're getting inspiration for the work. The work is out there. The problem for me, and probably some of you, is that it's always going to be a stretch that takes me out of my huddle, out of the comfort zone, 
to get where God wants me to go. Just like he told Noah, spread out, go into all the earth, replenish the earth. In that day, he was talking biologically. But with the bio biology of it all comes the spirituality of it. What I mean by that is simply this. It was necessary to repopulate the earth, but to replenish the earth? Folks, you and I have a job that's much greater than biology. To replenish the earth of worshiping the one true living God. How big a job is that? You know, I love babies, and every time a baby is born to somebody that I know and love, or even if I just see one, we're involved, and somebody passes and they got a stroll, and there's that little bundle. You know, I love babies. But you know, in the scheme of things, we need more spiritual babies. There need to be more people coming to Christ. There need to be more people witnessed to. And that is the work that we prepare for in here. And folks, if all we're ever doing is preparing for the work and never actually getting into the game, we're in love with the huddle. We're not in love with the cross. I read a story once about a fisherman society that they gathered together every Thursday and they talked about fishing. They talked about lures. They talked about bait. They talked about lines. They talked about poles. They talked about nets. They talked about all sorts of fishing, the techniques about how to throw the net, techniques about where to cast that fly. And at the end of the meeting, they would go home. They would gather back the next Thursday night. They would talk more about techniques of fishing. They would talk more about nets. But somehow, those people that came together and did all that talking, all that learning, all that sharing, never put a hook in the water. What good is it? No good at all. What good is it if we come here day after day, week after week, we think about reaching the world for Christ. We think about reaching this community for Christ. And we never put a hook in the water. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say, I will make you learners of how to fish. He said, I'll teach you on the job as you go. Incidentally, that's how you translate Matthew 28, 18 through 20. As you go throughout the world, preach the gospel, make disciples teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. My prayer each day is for God to have his way with me. It's something like Wesley's covenant prayer. We've shared that. It's in our hymnal. <clears throat> Wesley's covenant prayer is a good paragraph long. I've shortened it to one sentence. How about that for Russellism? <laughs> well, my prayer goes something like this. Every single day, God use me. Lose me, abuse me, or whatever else you see fit to do with me. Only let me be of service. That is what it takes to get into the game. Am I good at it? Well, I'd be able to answer that question if I was in it as much as I want to be in it. <coughs> it's not a question of being good at it. Question of whether you were willing to be in it at all. Another question: What would God have us to do about the towers in our lives? Well, Nimrod had two decisions facing him when he arrived in the city of or the community of Shinar. He could grab control, or he could allow the spreading of the people to repopulate the earth as God had decreed. You know what he did? He chose control because that's the easiest, most human thing that we do. The question is, what will you do? What will I do? Do we want towers in our life? You know, when you're trying to control everything and the God of the universe begins to confuse everything like he did with the languages there at the Tower of Babel, and everything and nothing in life makes sense at all anymore, that's God working. He does it for a very specific reason. It's because his command is for us to do things his way and we want to do things our way. That was Nimrod's problem, and that's our problem. A couple of questions for <clears throat> mulling it over in your mind this week. Are you coming to a point in your life where relationships are falling apart? It doesn't really make any sense. How about your finances? Do they make sense? 
Are you worried about the election results? Does that make sense? How about your retirement? Are you worried about that? Does nothing seem to make sense the way things are happening anymore? Oh, how about the COVID? Does that make any sense? How about the topsy-turvy of our lives in this world today? Does that make any sense? We need to decide in our hearts to release control and stop being Nimrod, because that's God's choice. You say, how? Preach, I get it. I mean, I get it that I'm supposed to let God be in control and not try to be in control like Nimrod, but how do I do it? Well, I'm glad that you asked, because I've got a couple of suggestions about that. And the only suggestion that really makes any sense is when it comes to towers in my life, whether it's a tower or counting on my retirement or on relationships I've built or on the house that shouldn't be crumbling around me or this or that. The only tower in my life is God. And I need to take down, I need to deconstruct any other towers that are in my life. Because those towers represent something that I am bowing to in worship. Yeah, I know, we're talking about priorities here. So here's a couple of suggestions about not giving in to the Nimrod temptation. First of all, do what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 3, where he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit because they realize, now I'm paraphrasing, they realize their need for God and the kingdom of heaven is going to be theirs. Acknowledge God as your only tower so that you can live in right relationship with him. It's the sinner's prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. It's the only way to begin dismantling the towers that get in the way of building a life centered around Christ. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your might, and everything else that you've got. Second suggestion is simply this. Keep perspective on who you are. Another of my favorite prayers, and you've heard me use it, I don't know how many times over the years, is, Dear God, I bow before you because you are God, and I am not. That's keeping perspective. A little story to end this thinking is about Theodore Roosevelt, the president. He had a friend by the name of William Beebe, who was a writer, and they shared a great friendship. They spent a lot of time together, and uh, they had this little game that they played toward the end of every day that they were together, in the evening time, when it started to get dark, they would go out onto the lawn and they would look up into the sky. They would look out into where the stars are and the blackness behind the stars. And they would find that faint <clears throat> spot of light, a mist really, beyond the lower left-hand corner of the great square of Pegasus, that constellation in the sky. And then one or the other, either William Beebe or Theodore Roosevelt, would recite this phrase. That is the spiral galaxy in Andromeda. It is as large as our Milky Way. It is one of a hundred million galaxies. And it consists of one billion suns, each larger than our own. And Roosevelt would grin, and he would say for both of them, I think we're small enough now. We can go to bed. That is a <coughs> perspective. Because, not just the vastness of the universe, but because Scripture tells us in Isaiah's prophecy that God holds every bit of it in the distance from the palm of his hand over to the tip of the finger. <coughs> that is known as the span of a hand. And Isaiah says in the 40th chapter that he holds all of that, every bit of the universe in the span of his hand, meaning that there's nobody else in control. Let's pray together. Father, we get it that our towers are all due to crumble, but in our humanity, we want our comfort zone. We want a little more power to feel safe. And so we wander from your words, commands to scatter. 
to go into all the world and preach the gospel so that the world would be repopulated with people who believe in Jesus Christ and who worship God Almighty and receive the Holy Spirit. But rather, we stay here. We build a little tower of pride here and there. We want to stand around and take credit for what we've done, kind of like Nimrod. Lord, drive us out of our comfy huddle like you drove Adam and Eve from the garden and Nimrod's crew from Babel. Confuse us enough so we don't camp here, Lord. Lord, you called us to be a people of tents, not towers. <clears throat> don't let the mortar of tar and the mud bricks clog our spiritual arteries. Lord, scatter us everywhere in your name. Forgive us, Lord, for loving our holy huddle more than the cross. Help us to keep perspective that our salvation comes from you and nothing, nothing will ever be stronger than the tower of your love for us. Give us courage to live outside the towers of pride and reputation. Lord, embolden us to travel to the furthest corners of the universe, if that will bring you glory. For the glory, the honor, and the praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit to honor and exalt the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives. Amen. <clears throat>